I've been investing for more than 15 years and early on I made some very expensive mistakes that cost me thousands and thousands of pounds. There was the house with rising damp which cost me thousands to fix, the flat with a dodgy lease and of course the one where my new tenants witnessed the shop opposite being set on fire within a week of moving in. Without some luck these mistakes could have killed my investing dreams when I was just getting started. But now I'm glad I've had these experiences because I know exactly what to look for and the right questions to ask when I'm considering a new purchase. And over time I've developed a seven step checklist that I use to make sure I don't buy another nightmare property, which I'll talk you through now. So imagine you had some money to invest. You found the perfect place, got the deal over the line, found the perfect tenants, and we're just waiting for that passive income to start rolling in. So you hand them the keys, they unpack their stuff, and they're just about to turn in for their first night in their new house when the neighbor starts banging his heart out on a drum kit. Then they wake up the next morning to find he's left his rubbish in their bin, and the next day they hear him and his girlfriend shouting until the early hours of the morning and need to call the police. Without knowing it, they found themselves in an episode of Nightmare Neighbors, and they'll be moving out as soon as they can, and telling anyone who comes around to view about the bad-tempered Dave Grohl wannabe next door. And the worst thing is, if you find this out after you buy, there's not much you can do about it. You can't force your neighbors to move. So what can you do to avoid this situation? Well, you need to be prepared and do your own research. That's why the first item on my checklist is the nightmare neighbor check. What's life like on the street you're thinking of buying on? Visit the property at different times of the day, especially in the evening when people are more likely to be home. Pay attention to anything that could be a red flag. Neighbors shouting at each other or people being drunk and disorderly on a Tuesday. Take a stroll around the street and see how well maintained other properties are. If they take care of their homes, chances are they'll respect yours too. But your gut feeling might not always be correct. So as part of the purchase process, your solicitor will also ask the seller directly. By law, they must inform you about major problems or disputes before you make the purchase. For example, if there's an ongoing agreement with the neighbors about ownership of a shared driveway. But that's not the only thing the seller has to tell you. Let's say you bought a new house with a decent sized garden, which the previous owner has extended into to create a larger kitchen with a bedroom above. But one day you get a visit from the local planning department asking to see proof that the extension has planning permission. Turns out the previous owner was more of the ask for forgiveness, not permission type. And now as the current owner, you're left with the hassle and expense of applying for retrospective permission and might even have to turn it down if permission is denied. The only saving grace is the local authority can only go back four years. If the unlawful work took place more than four years ago, you can apply for a lawful development certificate and all will be good. But the possibility of these expensive and stressful issues is why step two on my checklist is legal issues. Your solicitor will look into this for you, but if you notice anything obvious like an extension or a newly fitted boiler or windows, do make sure that they've seen all the relevant consents and permissions. But your due diligence can't stop there. It needs to go beyond the property itself and your immediate neighbors. So maybe you get lucky and the people on the street are very friendly. But what about the wider neighborhood? How do you know that your tenants will feel safe? There's plenty that won't show up in official documents and doesn't need to be disclosed by a seller, yet will still significantly reduce the value of your investment and your ability to rent it out. For that reason, third on my list is a local area check. An easy place to start with this is to look up the postcode ahead of time on streetcheck.co.uk. You can specifically look up information about the area, the age group, the demographic, and the crime rate to avoid a nasty shock when you purchase the property. However, before you freak out about the number of crime reports you see, remember it's all relative. And even the fanciest area can look like a war zone if you don't have a reference point. So always compare the crime rate with other areas. But I'd also suggest going one step further and actually talking to the locals who know the ins and outs of the area. They may well know things that you can't find online. Is there a group of young kids who cruise around the area every night looking for houses to rob? Or does the pub down the road attract some interesting characters on a match day? You probably can't find that online, but it can have a big impact on the satisfaction of your tenants. And if you interpret the data correctly, it will also help you with this next point which can be extremely costly if you get it wrong. So imagine you buy a property in what I'll politely call a budget-friendly area. This isn't always the case, but often the applicants you'll attract to rent your property won't be the most financially stable. And a good rental yield on paper means nothing if your tenant doesn't reliably pay it, leaving you with months of costs with no income and possibly a lengthy legal process to get them out. That's why number four on my checklist is the rentability check, which means more than just will someone rent here. In just about every part of the UK, you'll attract plenty of applicants 
tenants if you price it correctly. But I'm also looking at whether I can attract the type of tenants I want. A big pool of quality applicants means you can get very picky about who you accept and radically reduce your chances of something going wrong. This is more of a gut feel that you develop over time rather than anything you can look at a data point to determine, but you can pick up clues from looking at the housing and employment tabs on StreetCheck. But it's not a highly complex science. In my portfolio, 90% of the issues I experience have come from being tempted by bargains and entering areas that aren't the best. But maybe the property you're buying comes with tenants in situ already, which means you'll need item number five on my list. Buying a property with tenants already in place can be brilliant and it's something I've done many times. It means you get paid from day one and you don't have all the hassle of finding new tenants immediately and probably no refurb costs either. But it very much depends on who those tenants are. If they're not reliable payers and aren't, aren't taking care of the property, you haven't just got a nice bonus. You've just bought yourself a major problem that will need solving. So item five on my checklist is the tenancy check. Make sure your solicitor gets four very important items from the seller. A copy of the tenancy agreement and all the documents that were provided at the start of the tenancy because if any are missing you'll need to put that right before you can end the tenancy through the courts. Proof that the tenant's deposit has been protected because if it hasn't that'll need resolving. You'll also need to arrange for that deposit to be passed to you. A rent statement so you can see if the tenant is behind with their rent and if they reliably pay on time. And an inventory from the start of the tenancy which you can compare against its current condition to see how well it's been looked after. And when it comes to buying flats there's something else you'll need to cross off your list. You probably know that if you're buying a flat that belongs to a larger building, you don't actually own it, at least not forever. Generally, you have a lease that says you have exclusive right to use the flat for a certain period of time, but after that, the rights revert to the ultimate owner. In property investment, we call this type of contract a leasehold. Scary as that sounds, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with leasehold. In practice, you're not going to let the clock tick down to zero and have your name removed from the deeds, but you do need to be on the lookout for a few things, which is why step five on my checklist is the leasehold check. How long is the lease for? Leases can be extended, but it comes at a cost. There are political changes in the works that will make this less of an issue, but as it stands, there are some key milestones. Is it 60 years or less? Then the bank will probably consider this too short and refuse you a mortgage. Is it 80 to 90 years? Then you'll have to extend the lease as soon as possible because the costs of an extension will increase after the 80 year mark. Ideally, you'll want to see 100 years or preferably 125, meaning you can own it for most of your investing lifetime and still sell it before lease length becomes an issue. Does the property come with a high service charge? There's obviously a relationship between the standard of facilities and the service charge, and there's nothing wrong with paying for a gym and a concierge if it allows you to charge a higher rent. But some developments come with a far higher service charge than the amenities justify, so you'll need to dig into previous year's accounts as part of the buying process. Are there any upcoming major works? Find out about any future work that needs doing. Roof repairs, plumbing upgrades, lift replacements, anything. The work may even be underway already, but if it hasn't been invoiced for, that invoice will come to you rather than the previous owner. Cyclical works like this are a good thing because it maintains the value of your investment, but ideally a reserve fund will have built up that means the cost won't fall wholly on you. Again, you'll be able to see this in the accounts. And if there's likely to be something coming up that there isn't a fund for already, that's still okay as long as you're prepared for it and you factored it into your offer. And the exact same goes for our final warning sign. As long as you understand it, you can use it to your advantage. When visiting a property, most people are able to spot obvious problems like cracked walls or holes in the ceiling. And although this sounds bad, at least you know what you're dealing with. What you need to be really careful of are the issues that lie beneath the surface because they're often much more difficult to spot to the untrained eye, but can be very expensive. For example, peeling wallpaper can mean penetrating damp. Roof timbers riddled with holes can signal the presence of woodwork. Uneven floors and doors that don't close properly can be a sign that the ground beneath the property is unstable. And if you miss something like this during your visit, it can end up being more costly than a hole in the ceiling. And if you do spot it, should you walk away from this type of property? Well, not necessarily, as long as you know what you're doing. When you take out a mortgage, your lender will send someone around to assess the property's value, and they might catch a few red flags here and there, but don't depend on them. They're not working for you, and they're not going to spot everything. So get your own survey done. The way to do this is to get in touch with a surveyor who's a member of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, or RICS. They'll make you a comprehensive report about existing 
existing problems, as well as potential issues that need a closer look from a specialist. Yes, it'll cost you some money, but for anything other than a purpose-built property where there are unlikely to be any issues, it's likely to be worth it. But here's the thing, no matter how bad it looks, you can still fix it. I've been there. I've bought properties in the past with a laundry list of issues, cracking ceilings, weak foundations, you name it. But what I did was ask the seller for a big discount, and then I had specialists come over to fix those problems. It takes time and it takes money, but at the end of the day, the repair costs were lower than the discount I'd achieved, so I ended up making a profit. So like we saw in point five, as long as you identify the problem, understand the associated costs, and have the right contacts to get the job done, these issues don't have to be deal breakers. They just need to be addressed, understood, and used to secure a significant discount. So as you can see, with the right knowledge and the right processes, even nightmare properties can potentially turn into a good deal. But what actually is a good deal? How can you tell if the numbers really stack up and if you're onto a winner? Well, watch this video next where I talk you through a simple process for doing exactly that.